Yes. So when we look at functional clues, if I order a, a nice coffee, uh, I expect that to be cold. That's a functional clue. If I've ordered a mocha latte, I'm not very familiar with all of the, but a moco, chocho, wacho, kind of whatever, <laughs> I want all of those ingredients in there. That's a functional aspect of did you meet my minimum requirement, which is the functionality of a good or service. And there are clues that reinforce that. The CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders who are looking to accelerate value through investments in customer experience and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with my dear friend and mentor, Lou Carbone, the founder of Experience Engineering, and by many credited as one of the fathers of the experience management discipline. Today, we're going to talk about all things customer experience and culture. Uh, Lou, thanks so much for joining. It's always great to chat with you and collaborate. Oh, it's an absolute honor to be uh, on your podcast, Matt. I, uh, so thrilled. Uh, respect all of the work you've done in this space over the years and uh, our collaboration and continued um, progression of thought in this space. So very, very excited. The pleasure is mine, Lou. It's been incredible together. Lou, one of the things we talk about a lot together is, um, and I love the way you put it, so I'd love to hear our audience to hear it from you directly, is how we're still transitioning from the industrial age to the experience economy, and what's the difference between the two, and why haven't we gotten there yet? Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, as, as we look at the world that we're living in today, it is so different uh, than the industrial age. Uh, we've, we live in an age of information. We live in an age of technology. We live in an age of experience. And yet, much of the discipline that we see in this space, many of the approaches that people take are built off of altered thinking. So even as we look at uh, gathering data, what we're looking at uh, is collecting data that really comes out of the quality movement to a great degree. And what we haven't evolved to is moving from understanding what people think to how they think. And uh, I think the greatest thing that's happened in the last 40 years that I've watched this space evolve is what I would call uh, the acknowledgement that emotion, uh, I kind of refer to it as the emotion notion, if you will, that, oh my God, emotion plays an important part in the world we live in. And it actually played an important part in the industrial age but what we haven't done is evolve business models and thinking to thinking about how customers think uh, as opposed to this idea of what did you think about what you just experienced and how can I improve it? And that's literally um, the understanding of consumers, employees, friends and family <laughs> in terms of emotion. And I think that that is one of the biggest elements that in the industrial age, it was all functionality. A lot of the times people think there's a false trade-off between emotion and analytics. That, you know, great creativity is all art and that we really, and, and it's, it is very powerful when you sit through a great uh, movie or a great ad campaign and you see and you feel really emotionally stirred by it. But that is something that actually you can apply as a discipline to understand the unconscious, understand the emotion, and actually have a continuous improvement cycle about emotion and how you evoke it along the customer journey. How, how do we make that fusion of emotion and analytics practical reality? Yeah, in fact, uh, what I refer to is the era of fusionomics, which everything is being fused together. And uh, this really requires understanding uh, neuroscience and psychology and the depth of understanding how people think, how we experience things, that uh, it's multisensory. 
uh, the opportunities that we have on this palette that we can draw from in the world of experience is so phenomenal. It's at our fingertips. And yet what we see is so many uh, bolt-on systems that are built where we're not looking at the holistic aspect of experience management and experience value, experiential value creation. This idea of experiential value creation uh, has existed back in the 50s when people actually said when you buy a product, you're buying the experience that comes with it. I, I, in fact, uh, there was a professor at uh, Columbia years ago, uh, Morris, oh, oh gosh, I'm going to draw a blank on the name now, but uh, he was really right in terms of you, the products that we buy come with an experience, but we thought of it mostly in terms of functionality. The P&G, they, they talked about the first two moments of truth, and a lot has been built since then. The first moment of truth is when she picks it up at the shelf, and the second moment of truth is when she uses the product. And of course, there's many moments of truth before the shelf. Google had the whole zero moment of truth thing. And then there's a whole, a whole movement now around beyond the product experiences, because that's what digital is enabling. And could you talk a little bit more about the experiences and and what you call clues, help our audience understand the you know what clues are. That experiences are built out of uh, an atomic structure that is literally what I call clues, and that atomic structure is multisensory. So they're even broken down even greater in terms of what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and an experience. So this whole construct of understanding that what we're processing unconsciously is a series of clues. It, it's happening right here in the room that I'm in and the way that the room is lit, uh, how I feel about myself in a room, uh, spatial, all of these things affect me in some way. So becoming clue conscious and understanding what these clues and signals are that we take in in the experience is a very powerful way of really breaking down an experience and engineering an experience to help create an emotional outcome. And uh, that emotional outcome is what I refer to as an experience motif, which is literally what are the emotions that someone desires feeling now when they visit Mayo Clinic, when I'm playing with my granddaughter whose birthday is today, with Legos later today, what are the emotions that each of us feel in this connection? And uh, that whole idea of connection is what a motif is about. And when we look at Legos, they are actually engineered and designed to snap together. And as you snap them together, you create this work that is a work of art and science. But they, they refer to the little bricks as having clutching power. Uh, and what clutching power is, is they're engineered so that every brick fits. You know, I've yet to have a Lego brick in my entire life, and they've been a client of ours, yet to have one that you couldn't snap together. They're engineered to fit. And that's what a motif is all about, is what's that glue? What creates that stiction, that ability to connect those clues together to create this experience as you put these clues together. And I think that what happens in the traditional way of looking at things in the industrial age, we're asking questions that are more about how something performed versus uh, how it made me feel. I'd like to spend a, a little bit more on clues, and then we'll come back to what you call the brand canyon, the, the difference between what, um, what a, you know, we'll, I'll let you define it and then steal your thunder. But um, uh, you, in your book, Clued In, and I want to emphasize this for our audience, uh, look, Lou wrote the book Clued In, which was one of my top 10 business books that I reviewed on Journey Spark Consulting. So it's one of my favorite all-time business books. I put it right up there with Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow with Danny Kahneman or books by Adam Grant and, and Simon Sinek. So this is a very influential book on me personally. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy it also. And include in, 
Lou talks about a lot of the ideas that we're we're looking at here, uh, and in particular the three types of clues: the the functional, the uh, mechanic, and the humanic. Could you elaborate on like the, what the three types of clues are, and maybe? And I always loved your example of Starbucks, which really brings this to life. Yes. So when we look at functional clues, if I order uh, an iced coffee, uh, I expect that to be cold. That's a functional clue. If I've ordered a mocha latte, I'm not very familiar with all of the, but a mocha, chocho, wacho, kind of whatever, <laughs> I want all of those ingredients in there. That's a functional aspect of did you meet my minimum requirement, which is the functionality of a good or service. And there are clues that reinforce that. The second are mechanic clues, and some people will refer to those as atmospherics, but it's more than atmosphere. It's uh, the physical environment, and mechanic clues can be signage, uh, mechanic clues at Disney that, uh, that were absolutely amazing when I was working with Disney at one point um, in my career, was the back of traffic signs were painted and finished because you experience them in 360 degrees. I was blown away by that, that particular concept in terms of mechanic clues that unconsciously gave you the sense that they paid such attention to detail. Uh, the way that they actually put uh, the curbing and landscaping was done in a series so that you would have curb, you would have space, you would then have the grass because it gave you a greater feeling of their ability to pay to an attention and everything is proper and in place and safe. When we say retail is theater, what we really mean is this: the experience yes. and the environment is critical. Yes. The mechanic yes. is critical. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How you set the stage. And, uh, you know, in early, early conversations when uh, Steve Heckle and I wrote that first article in this space, Joe Pine and I had many meetings. And then as Joe and Jim articulate in, uh, in the experience economy, that there is a part of it that's theater, which people had difficulty understanding at the beginning of this movement going, well, what are you talking about? It's theater and acting is not sincere. So that brings us to humanic clues. And humanic clues are all the way from gestures that someone may have to language that they use. And uh, these are things that Apple has employed uh, in their retail environment in terms of humanics. Uh, and the no one will ever use the word the that your computer is frozen. That's a verboten word in Apple language. So understanding the clues, the signals that come in gestures, that come in eye contact. Um, one of our early early supermarket experiences that we designed, we created an eye color key in the, in the register, in their computerized register system, so that eye contact would be made. There are ways to engineer these clues into an experience. Um, uh, we created micro-encapsulated floor wax, and that's what Steve and I wrote about was the work that was being done that I was doing at that time almost uh, well, a number of decades ago. So if we bring this back to Starbucks, if you allow me for a second, there's functional, there's mechanic, which is the environment, the sensory environment, and there's humanic, which is person to person. And the in a Starbucks example, there are plenty of functional clues around the cup size, the price, how hot or cold it is, et cetera, et cetera. But what really creates the emotional connection and the brand premium that Starbucks has over a regular cup of joe is the environment you're in. It's the music. When you come in and you smell the coffee grounds and you hear it being it, and then you see the visual merchandising and you feel you're in an authentic coffee experience and you see the posters, which connects locally to the environments where coffees grow and it's emotional sensory experience, even looking at photography. And then more importantly, I think, is the human to human interaction that drives the customer experience, not just the barista, but actually with the other people you're with. People refer to Starbucks as the third place. There's home, there's work, and there's Starbucks. They actually have branded 
And, and in fact, it's owned by the community. This brand of the third place is something people, whether they talk about it explicitly or not, they know let's meet at Starbucks. Absolutely, Matt. Uh, what was uh, the third place at one point in this country were barber shops, uh, where people would gather. And in barber shops, I mean, there were people that didn't need a haircut that would go to the barber shop <laughs> to exchange information <laughs> and create a sense of community. Uh, there were taverns that create this sense of community. And uh, Cheers was probably the there's a TV show, the actual idea of what a third place is all about to become family the place, for, a, the place where everybody knows your name exactly yeah so what becomes so powerful uh in managing those clues um when howard schultz went to italy and uh, at that time he was with starbucks and went to italy and you could hear the tapping of the espresso being tapped out and he noticed that the same, you know, that there were people there in the morning, there were people there in the afternoon, and in Italy, they, were, they probably never left. But he was amazed that this was a base in the morning and a base in the afternoon. It was a way of starting the day and a way of finishing the day, acknowledging that there are rituals that we have. So Schultz really broke through, uh, and yet there were other people even before Schultz, like Leonard Riggio, that understood when he created Barnes & Noble, he utilized what were library-type lighting or classroom lighting in the stores to create this sense of education, of learning, of knowledge. So that's so critical. Now, when we begin to look at the humanics, the power of humanics uh, are unbelievable in terms of uh, human connection and you begin to combine and focus on those three elements as clues. So what we've done with the systematic way of thinking of deconstructing and reconstructing and engineering experiences on the basis of these clues that have categories and then have subcategories that are sensory so that we can actually design them saying, is there anything more I can do from a sensory perspective? And this is opposed to traditional design in the world of experience management in terms of journey mapping, tends to move much more toward functionality versus stimulating imagination and creation. The emotional versus the rational. It's the emotional versus the rational, the unconscious versus the conscious. Of course, you want both. But if you don't pay attention to the emotional, you're not building a brand and you're not building a good customer experience, and you need both together. Could you elaborate on... Um, the uh, the difference between brand and customer experience and what you mean by the term brand canyon. Yeah, so I, I think the word brand, brand to me as we thought about it in our past is, is something that uh, is, is literally passe. That uh, when I think of the way that we thought about brand and, you know, you look at something like the Mayo Clinic, it was a symbol. It was a way of identifying something. And what it identifies is an actual experience. So what this this whole idea of communicating in an experience is all about uh, is we've moved from identifying something to realizing that the brand is the experience and the experience is the brand. But where it takes place is up here in, a, in our customers' minds. So this Brand Canyon, what we thought about in the past is how do you feel about Mayo Clinic? And we're focused on that. And we manage the value of how you thought about Mayo Clinic. The, the brand identity, the brand personality, the brand blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And what was so huge to me when I was in advertising and uh, I was the vice president of marketing at National Car, we'd spend fortunes on color correction, which was back in the ancient days of film and, and, and making sure that the colors were right, and yet we'd go into our real experience, and it was so different than what we portrayed in advertising. And that would happen in automobile. Uh, when, when you look at going out to buy an automobile, you'd feel hunted and chased versus the thrill of what buying an automobile is all about. 
So I think that there's a, a, a huge difference. And we, as we moved out of that thinking about product, we started thinking about service and said, oh, the brand is really about the service that we provide. The brand is ultimately how we cause a customer to feel about themselves, which in turn is how they feel about the brand. So, yeah, I could go to Mayo, but Mayo makes me feel like I am so important to them that I am number one. And Mayo's basic principle is the needs of the patient always come first. And everyone has that tattooed on their forehead, basically, on their arms. But more importantly, they live it. And there are so many organizations that will post values all over the place. When you live your values and deliver what a customer desires feeling, you end up having a company that has virtue. It's, it's a virtue. And that's different than having values. So thank you, Lou. So to play this back for our audience, what we're talking about here is, is I find really powerful because it connects customer experience, employee experience, and culture in a way that no one does better than Lou. And, the, and I've learned so much from you. I'm deeply grateful. The, um, um, the sensory experiences, the human-to-human -human experiences, this emotional connection you have, it influences how we feel about ourselves in the journey and the way our employees feel about themselves in the journey too. So the customers and the employees interact with each other and the human to human experiences that are critical clues are clues that our employees pick up on as well. And you talk about our employees being clue conscious. So when we think about culture, you know, if we don't pay attention to clue consciousness and raise the clue consciousness of our people, and we don't actually drive the right learning and behaviors in the, in the organization, it's an enormous missed opportunity to actually deliver our brand and, uh, on our brand promise. And, and when people talk about why purpose is so important to value and customer experience is important to value, they're actually kind of coming at the same thing which is that culture and employee experience and customer experience all go together to create value. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and Matt, when we talk about employee experience, uh, some of the work that, that I've been blessed, I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am to have had the experiences and opportunities I've had in my career. But the work that we did with uh, John Deere on the first day experience, of first day of work, that um, actually was uh, written about in uh, Moments of Matter that were written by, it was written by Dan and Chip Heath. And then there's a video that he does and actually talks about uh, that in, in the video that he does and talks about the work that we did at John Deere, uh, where there were clues that started from the moment that you accepted a position on where to park, you had a person that you could contact that was basically what we referred to as a dear friend. First message that you received was from Sam Allen, the CEO, talking about the purpose of the organization as opposed to just the function of what they provide. Very, very powerful. I have been very blessed to have trade publications write about work that we've done for clients at La Quinta, John Deere, uh, because it does strike a different way of looking at the world and creating experiential value. You can proactively link the experience of your customer and your employee back to your brand. You talked earlier about the emotional motif. Uh, I'm going to uh, fast forward it back to the age of AI now, where everyone's talking about how to create experiences, how to measure experiences, how to personalize experience, all very important. But what we often don't hear about is, it, and when we talk about measuring emotion, a lot of the times people are talking about reducing pain points and understanding emotion in like a call center interaction or something like that to drive training and things like that. But there's something much more profound here 
about understanding your emotional motif and then measuring the congruence with the actual experience with what you want to achieve in your brand. How do you actually get the upfront insights and then the ongoing measurements so that it actually allows you to focus on your emotional motif? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, the, the, the shortfall of what I would call sentiment, which is, you know, is someone feeling positive, negative, or, or whatever, uh, we know that, that uh, I was blessed again with uh, being able to work with Jerry Zaldman uh, when he created the Laboratory of the Consumer Mind at the Harvard Business School. And uh, first thing we did was actually did uh, uh, PET scans of people and the automobile buying experience to look at what parts of the brain were ignited in that experience and uh, then compare that to other experiences. And buying an automobile was the closest thing to being chased and hunted. So when we began to look you, at this... You call Jerry, these deep, then, ma deep metaphors, right? The, you're, what you're talking about are examples exactly. of deep, deep metaphors, yeah. Yeah, so what Zaltman's work was all about was looking at deep metaphors. And Zaltman's work comes out of the work of Antonio Damasi, who is probably one of the leading uh, people in terms of looking at how do we begin to understand unconscious thought. And this idea of unconscious thought and frameworks, we have mental models and frameworks that exist in our unconscious. And we put those things together in a puzzle. Um, and when we talk about clues, they actually will spark a emotion. That emotion then sparks an attitude, and talking about sparks here, Matt, but uh, that attitude sparks and ignites our behavior in terms of how we behave as a human being. So it's this basic human understanding of how we think versus what we think, and aligning ourselves with how we think and understanding that we can then avoid what I would call exhaust fumes and fixing broken things to managing the engine and the fuel that we put into the engine. So, you know, I think a lot of organizations are inhaling basically exhaust fumes and still living in the world of the industrial age, which is fixing broken versus how do I create distinctive value? So if we talk about buying advertising versus building experiences, buying loyalty versus earning loyalty, you know, this is a totally different mindset and, and way of working. Uh, a lot of really good work's been done on like what is loyalty, what does loyalty really mean? And I, I like to think of the loyalty loop as if we reduce, if we, if we understand the deep metaphor, and we understand the emotional motif, and then we create an experience with the right peaks on it and not just focus on draining the pain, we actually create the right emotional connection, then we actually play into the way the human mind really works, which is we abhor effort. And if you give people a strong emotional connection without friction, with less friction, then people will build that bond and, and continue to buy something and be loyal because, with, completely unconsciously. Uh, and if we make them work hard and we introduce friction, then that's what thinking slow is. That actually undermines loyalty. So it's actually all aligned to your school of thought around deep metaphors, emotional motif, and, and emotional and conscious thought. That's how loyalty is built. Exactly. Matt, if I go back on, on loyalty, um, when, uh, you know, I, I, my, throughout my career, I had worked with National Car through three advertising agencies. I uh, basically started my career with National as a client. National, and many people don't know about trading stamps in this era, uh, but SNH green stamps were offered by National Car as a sense of creating a feeling of reciprocity. Trading stamps and loyalty were built off of, I give you something, you give me something in return. When I became the vice president of marketing at National Car, uh, loyalty was such a big thing as we created the third loyalty program in the country and then the elements that included uh, the Emerald Isle and uh, selecting your own car, all of these things that 
really dealt with unconscious clues. Because what we learned in that work uh, when we were going to drop SNH green stamps, there were studies that we did on what kind of business would we lose if we did away with SNH green stamps. And what we actually learned is unless you actually focus on the experience itself, you will lose business. So understanding the essence of loyalty, I think, is part of what has been ingrained in my brain from uh, moving out of the world of being a journalist into the world of advertising and marketing uh, was understanding that bond, what I call stiction, which is the um, having a signal that's so strong that it sticks with you, that uh, it's an engineering term that's used in uh, electronic in electrical engineering. So um, one thing I think our, our audience may want to follow up on, you know, after the podcast is, is to understand more about this connection of brand and customer experience and how, uh, how, how they can go deeper on that. And, and your book is certainly one place to start. You and I have been writing a blog series together about reimagining insights uh, that we're continuing to collaborate on with the, the 10 absolutes of experience management. Um, so stay tuned for more of those uh, blogs that Lou and I are working on together. I'd like to shift it gears for a little bit to go a little deeper um, on the employee and culture side of things as opposed to the brand CX. They're all mutually enforcing, of course. So you talked about clue consciousness and how the company's employees at all levels can be conscious of clues. And it becomes a vocabulary and a, a school a school of thought, a way of approaching the world. How do you actually then leverage that to evolve the culture of the company? How does clue consciousness fit into the culture and the fabric of the organization? Well, if you think of uh, culture and you know acculturation in an organization, as we look at um, the the clues and signals, what we fail to do. Um, in many organizations is design the internal experience. Well, we, we think that it's going to happen uh, magically. I call that managing by crossing your fingers and hoping. Uh, whereas, you know, and I think this happens even in designing an experience for an organization. We never design the experience for the organization. It's for the customer. And we never stop to say, how are we going to make this a reality within our organization to live what is basically this experience motif, deliver that, and become an organization that has virtue, that goes beyond value. So I think that this whole idea of becoming clue conscious and understanding the importance of emotion is also the basis of what creates a culture. And that that's why I think the fusion, uh, the intersection, uh, and that's actually the fusion of our work and this, what we've been talking about on how do you fuse the culture, uh, because I think there are so many organizations that are making efforts to try to make a difference in the world. A lot of money invested in what I call voice of the customer versus mind of the customer. How do we begin to move out of the industrial age and into this new age where pieces need to be fused together to create experiences that really bond people in a way that is distinctive and differentiated. Lou, other than picking up a copy of Clued In, your book, um, or seeing our um, blog series, Reimagining Insights, they can find on uh, Journey Spark Consulting's website, what are other resources or things you suggest the audience take advantage of to learn more about the topics we talked about today, other than connecting with you and, and on LinkedIn? Yeah. I think that an awareness of psychology, an awareness of um, what I would call uh, neuroscience, uh, beginning to understand that um, we even look at something as simple as the title as Chief of the Experience Officer. My vision for that title when I created it for myself decades ago, and probably the first customer experience officer, 
was that that is the role of a CEO in an organization. And I think that what happens is there's this myopic view of the world that if I'm in marketing, I don't read psychology. I don't learn about art. I don't do this. I don't do that. I think we need to realize that this is a time of renaissance and that this whole renaissance of experiential value creation is the ultimate and that artificial intelligence alone is not going to get us there. You can collect data. You can create knowledge. But wisdom is the ultimate goal. And I think that it's the collective pulling all those pieces together. 100%. Um, the um, one last thought, and um, I'll plug this uh, for us together, is uh, we collaborate on coaching with clients and we collaborate on workshops and research with clients. So uh, Lou and I will be thrilled if you're interested to have a conversation about the things you're interested in focusing on and your range of interest to lose point about being a renaissance person. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. And if there's a great fit for you, we would be delighted to help uh, provide coaching and workshops to help you raise the clue consciousness of your leaders, managers, and frontline employees. Thank you, Matt. That, uh, what an, uh, we're living in such exciting times. And uh, I just, my deepest wish is that organizations can dig so deep and find new ways of creating extraordinary value for their employees and, and for their patrons. It's such a emotionally rewarding experience to have an impact. We all want to have an impact. And, uh, you know, learning from you and collaborating to help have even more impact together is so rewarding. So thank you for all your mentorship and collaboration and for sharing that with our audience today. Um, you can learn more about Lou on um, Experience Engineers website. Lou, do you want to share that with the audience? Uh, www.expeng.com or experienceengineering.com or L. Carbone at expeng.com. Uh, Happy to forward. I've got a number of academic articles uh, that, that I've collaborated on and written over the years. I've got uh, a number of things. If anyone wants any of that data or information, I'd be happy to share that. Thank you very much, Lou. It's always been a, uh, always a pleasure. You always spark a lot of ideas for me, um, and I hope you did for our audience as well. I know you did for our audience as well. Uh, thank you so much, Lou, uh, for your time today. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm honored to I'm honored and grateful to have you as a friend and a collaborator and someone that uh, is on this Renaissance crusade uh, and finding other champions for this thinking. Thank you. We're on the journey together. Thank you, everybody. Have Absolutely. a great day. Absolutely. We're sparking.